With Tony? No, my recorder. Good evening! My recorder. All right, let me hear you say yeah. It's, a, it's on, okay. It's kind of in the wrong arena. Let me hear say yeah. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much uh, for coming this evening, Ron Zimmerman, Marjorie Gross, and myself. And, you know, this is another evening of absolute nonsense. Um, and we've, been, we've called this, are we deep or what, part two. Scooting back. Be subtle and clever, don't you think? Uh, 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 how insecure can you get? And I'm sure that many, many insecure people here this evening. And right here. Choking on her role. Part the expression. But you know, so I would like... I would like to bring up my secret lover. No, no, not all the time. The funniest and most fabulous person in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, you know him, you love him. Here he is, Michael Hutchins. No, I'm only kidding. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mickey Rock, ladies and gentlemen. Ron fucking Zimmerman right here. Let me have a ride. celebrity poetry readings that would recapture all the warmth and humility of the readings that used to go on at Helena's. We were unsuccessful. Not only was the evening a vulgar, rude, heartless lambasting of our artistic goals, but people actually laughed out loud at the celebrity poets. The entire evening was considered by most a parody of what we were trying so sincerely to achieve. Why anyone would laugh at Scott Baio sharing his innermost thoughts in sweet verse is a complete mystery to me. The damage to Michael DeBar was even more severe. Until tonight, Michael has spent each day and night since December sitting naked on a hard wooden chair in a closet at a monosyllabic bass player's apartment in Echo Park, <laughs> sucking a pair of wet corduroy pants for the moisture to keep himself alive. <laughs> As for myself, well, I'm on these fiendishly strong antidepressants, so it didn't bother me much, but that's not the point. The point is, we're back tonight with what we hope is a new and better attitude from our audience and poets. So strong was our commitment to the seriousness of this occasion, we enlisted avant-garde poet and rewrite night sitcom joke hack Marjorie Rose to help us. <laughs> Putting a show together with this caliber of stars oh, should have been an easy task. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we got attitude from these people so infantile, it would have sent Bob Geldof crawling back to the Boomtown Rats. <laughs> By the way, don't worry where the money raised here is going. It's none of your fucking business. <laughs> but that's not the point either. The point of this night, my friends, is poetry, pure and simple. Our commitment to honor the great art of poem is unflinching, unwavering, unnerving, unsettling, ungrateful, uninspired, uncool, unentertaining, unlawful, uncola, uncomfortable, under the boardwalk, unhand me, sir, unsung, unprepared, unmemorable, unrewarding, uninsightful, unkind, under the yum yum tree, unmentionable, unquotable, uncouth, unsightly, and underhanded. If we succeed in making it all these things, then we will have given you exactly what a real pretentious poetry night is supposed to offer. I hope you take what follows just as seriously as Michael, Marjorie, and myself do. Now, poetic patrons, in the words of Dylan Thomas, or it may have been Bob Dylan. No, wait, it was Kevin Dylan. No, 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 no. I think it was, actually it was Justine Bateman. Anyway, it was, it was a great poet. 
<laughs> it's time to get deep. Time to get deep. <laughs> Say underwhelming. <laughs> we are proud tonight to have a member of one of America's greatest theatrical dynasties. Now I know you're thinking, oh God, no, not a Carradine. <laughs> Simmer down. Nobody's gonna sing, I'm easy. Grasshopper is not in the building. <laughs> now our next poet is Drew Barrymore. Our first poet is Drew Barrymore. An actress we've all watched grow from an adorable little girl to a sophisticated 40-year-old in seven years. <laughs> Tonight is kind of a hallmark occasion for Drew, since it's her first public appearance in four years face up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first nighters, cover paying public, the heir to the Barrymore porcelain bus, Drew Barrymore. father was Maurice Barrymore, a respected an actor and drunk who died in the gutter. My great uncle was Lionel Barrymore, who left a legacy of films which will be remembered for all time, and a drunk who died in the gutter. <laughs> My great aunt Ethel Barrymore was the first lady of the theater and a role model for all actresses who came after her who died in the gutter. <laughs> well, wait. That doesn't sound right. It sounds like I'm saying all actresses who came after Ethel Barrymore died in the gutter. That's not true. My great aunt died in the gutter without any other actresses. <laughs> My grandfather, John Barrymore, known to moviegoers as a great profile, is still considered one of the greatest English-speaking actors of all time. Okay, guess where he died? Say it with me, in the gutter. <laughs> My aunt Diana, too much too soon Barrymore, <laughs> cut the red tape of theatrical success and beelined it straight to the gutter. <laughs> At this juncture in my poem, I'd like you to all note that I wasn't even a gleam in anyone else's eyes through all of this, so quit looking at me like that. <laughs> On an up note, not all, of my not all of my relatives died in the gutter. Some are alive. My father, John Barrymore Jr., is thought as a talented actor who missed the mainstream and developed instead a loyal cult following and a tight-knit group of close friends he can borrow money from, like me and my brother. <laughs> my mother, for some kooky reason, ditched the Barrymore name and calls herself Jade constantly, and not necessarily when anyone else is in the room with her. <laughs> perfect role model mom. Of course, I'd like to say Firestarter made a hundred million dollars and I'm sitting pretty for life. But neither of those things are true. You know what I got out of Firestarter? A big plush sofa. You know what I got out of my mom? Someone, somebody to lie on it and whine all day. I love my mother. Now I guess you're all wondering the same thing. With a family like that, how is it that little Drew is so normal? <laughs> Doesn't she have any problems? Why is she such a sweet, wholesome, well-rounded teen? <laughs> well, sometimes I wonder why life has been such a carefree lark. <laughs> now, let me give you Drew's tips for trouble-free teens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Number one, always make sure your homework is completed on time. That way you'll have the respect of other kids, your mom, your set tutor, and most importantly, the director. Number two, always eat a nutritious lunch. Have your agent call the caterers and make sure that they give you plenty of fresh, fresh squeezed juice and vegetables and protein for energy. Don't be afraid to ask them to fly in special foods. <laughs> Number three, always have a smile on your face and be nice to everyone, even the extras. Remember, they're people too, and if you treat them good, they'll run errands for you. <laughs> Number four, help out around the house. <laughs> Moms don't always feel like cooking and cleaning, especially when they've been in their rooms catatonically depressed for six months straight. <laughs> Look for the warning signs and carry their psych psychiatrist and family ambulance company phone numbers in your lunchbox or manager's purse. <laughs> Number five, don't talk to strangers unless they show a valid ID press card. Even then, it's better off going through your publicist. <laughs> Keep these handy tips in mind, and remember, troubled teens, if Drew can toe the line, so can you. I'm Marjorie Gross. I got involved in this because my life is a tedious, boring nightmare. <laughs> I hope you like it. I got involved in this because my life is a tedious, boring nightmare. I watch so much TV, I make myself sick. If you were, if you were me, you'd be here too. And you are. So don't pretend your lies are anything to crow about. Next stanza. <laughs> There's so many things I need and want, but none are in this room. What can I say? I'm a flippy gibbet, a will o' the wisp, a kooky prophet of doom. <laughs> okay. Okay. Michael DeBar is known to most of you as that rock guy who married that, who played in that rock band, is married to that rock chick who wrote that rock book about a bunch of rock guys. Michael's courtship, marriage, career, and fatherhood didn't take, didn't buy him as many pages as Don Johnson's penis. <laughs> One of the founding fathers of this kind of shameless, desperate, publicity-grabbing folly, which under scrutiny is nothing more than a waste of ener everyone's energy, time, and favors. I mean, I was going to hit up Katie Seagal for this trip to New York, and now I'll have to listen to her sing four more times to replenish my favor stock. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Okay, five times. <laughs> Michael's been an indispensable member of this creative team. How could we have put this show together if Michael wasn't helped hold up with some 20-year-old MacGyver groupie? Without Michael's daily, how's it going, my darlings? If you need me, I'll be at Hugo's, phone calls, spur spurring us on to greatness. Who else could have corralled so many big stars into committing to this event and then canceling at the last minute? <laughs> Michael, is doing this for the reasons that drive all artists of his caliber to get out of a bubble bath with a teen heiress, make someone go out five miles out of the way to pick him up and take him to perform. Dedication, passion, and a 50-50 cover split with the owner of this cramped, tiny sardine can of a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> Producers, assembled press, and celebrities, put your hands together and hide your home phone numbers. It's Michael DeVar. <laughs> Yeah, right. How come I'm almost mentioned in the same breath as Don Johnson's penis? I don't know. It's not that big. Not that I would know, Miss P told me. Okay. Right, my suit. Uh, you know, somebody said, what are you masquerading to be normal, Michael? I mean, okay. Everyone needs a credo. And I've finally discovered mine. I found it in the mirror. I must have been blind not to see that the credo I shall let ring out is me. Me, me. <laughs> I'm all that matters. My needs must come first. This may sound a little selfish, but you haven't heard the worst. 
I want someone applauding whenever I change my shoes. There's no star I won't buddy up with if it gets me on the news. I want groupies gushing when I stand to take a pee. Because the words that I now live by are me, me, me. I guess the president's an important guy, but I don't really care. What's far more, far more important is um, how I wear my hair. Thank you. It's good, darling. It? This is my Rob Lowe bad influence look. Do you like it? The movie sucks. Anyway, um, the Berlin War's important. Nah, it's not worth a hill of beans. What you should be more interested in is how I look in these jeans. <laughs> God, that's funny. Um, don't you people understand? Can't you people see? You should only be concerned with prisons. Is toxic waste such a big deal when all is said and done? I mean, as long as it doesn't shut down MacGyver, which would end my recurring run. What's all this about health food? I don't care what you eat. Go out and rent me a pink Cadillac if you want a tasty treat. Self-serving way. Is this over to tell? This is. Are you gonna love me anyway? Three people said yes. <laughs> Thank you, William Morris, two seven four seven four five one. Michael, they brought um, age range sixteen to sixty. Thank you. <laughs> like I haven't used that before. Um, let me continue. I like twenty-year-old girls, and I deserve them too. <laughs> I'm a glam rock legend. Fuck Scott Bayo's TVQ. <laughs> now please don't get the wrong idea. I'm as humble as can be. I can't help it that the world revolves around. Precisely, thank you so much. <laughs> this is David Faustino's first poetry night. His, his spirits must be soaring like an eagle. I know mine were when I first broke my celebrity poetry night cherry. <laughs> it was a chilly October night. I was dressed like a legend waiting to happen. <laughs> the crowd was buzzing with excitement. My Alf had just aired. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, needless to say, I was pumped with that special energy you get playing opposite a sock. <laughs> what joy I take sharing this glorious moment in time with you, David, who I will always think of as a second son. Unless, of course, his, um, his show doesn't go the full five years. <laughs> David, I pass to you now the poet's sacred paper music stand thing. Come up here, David Moishech Judah Ben Faustino. <laughs> Today you are a poet. Greet him now, David Faustino. The Ballad of Patrick Swayze. <laughs> <laughs> he came to us from North and South. That's the miniseries, not the place. With steel in his eyes and a swagger to his walk, casting agents tripped over themselves to gaze upon his handsome face. His name is Swayze, Patrick Swayze. <laughs> and his pecs glistened in the sun. His name was Swayze, Patrick Swayze. <laughs> if you make a crack about his mom, he'll get a little plucky. But never, oh never, tell him he just got lucky. <laughs> then one day came Jennifer Grey, whose dad was the scary queen in Cabaret. <laughs> She was just a bright-eyed kid when she met Patrick Swayze. The first time she saw him dance, he made Gene Kelly look lazy. And then he took her in his waxen oiled arms. They danced their now famous mambo. She heard the gaffers whisper, hey, they make quite a combo. His name was Swayze, Patrick Swayze. He wore his toe shoes like Sundance wore his gun. His name was Patrick. I heard no, his name was Swayze. <laughs> Patrick Swayze. 
The world would never be the same once he was done. His name on a contract is every producer's goal. But never, I mean never, offer Swayze just a good supporting role. After Dirty Dancing, he was big box office. He was in, and there was no People Choice Awards that he couldn't win. But then he stopped at the Roadhouse to visit his next of kin. <laughs> he didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what to do. Till, he, till a voice rang out from the skies. You're no Jack Nicholson, it's time for Dirty Dancing too. His name was Swayze. Patrick Swayze. His career took off like a rocket. His name was Swayze. Patrick Swayze. If he's not careful, He'll be a dancing with Sonny Crockett. <laughs> Thank you. What can we say about Eve Plum? <laughs> well, how about? Jen, in an effort to become more popular, joins poetry night at a local cafe in the hope of, hope of attracting the cute new fullback at school and a better agent. Back at home, Greg and Marcia have their hands full in their race to become the Brady that ages the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Alice and a very upset Cindy speculate about Mr. Brady's sexual preferences. <laughs> And the whole family is shocked when mom reveals that she's not the one with the glass eye. <laughs> also watch for a special cameo appearance by Nancy Walker as Gladys, Alice's overbearing, sociopathic, codependent, anal retentive, obsessive compulsive sister. And now, uh, performing for only the second time, material not written by Sherwood Schwartz. <laughs> today. Jesus H. Christ, I'm telling you, in my day, these little rugrats wouldn't have stood a chance. I just did sex hour longs over at Paramount, where I used to have a TV cue that would make Kirk Cameron's head spin. I mention that only in passing. Now, we didn't behave like these kids nowadays, and nowadays they have their own dialogue coaches, a tutor, a mother, voice coach, drivers, shrinks, right down to the clown that entertains them during lunch. And let's not forget the snotty attitudes on these brats. I mean, the last thing I need is some growth-stunted ten-year-old giving me a line reading and telling me Scotty Bio is yesterday's news. I mean, the man is a genius in our industry. <laughs> they don't care. They don't respect any of the old school, the old pros. Let me tell you, Scotty Bio gives till it hurts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Scotty. And Drew Barrymore, she knows the score. Hey, Drew, I hope that's ginger ale you're drinking. <laughs> and David Cassidy, the granddaddy of them all. Hell. If Gavin McLeod shows up, we're going sailing. <laughs> Get Sagansky on the phone. We got a two hour MOW on this joint. <laughs> all right, all right, I lost my place. Uh, oh, yeah, the old days. Now, Jody Foster talks about uh, doing gun smoke and uh, bonanza. Hey, Miss Academy Award winner. <laughs> Miss Accused. <laughs> I got two big valleys and a Virginian under my belt. <laughs> so all I'm saying here is um, Barbara Stanwyck, legend for all time. Lauren Green, dead guy from Canada. <laughs> deserves the Oscar. <laughs> yeah, Jody, Bonanza was real tough. You and Monsieur Mark, you got Hop Singh to answer to. <laughs> Get in a two shot with Linda Evans and then call me. <laughs> and you didn't catch me sniffing the onion to work up a good cry with Barbara Stanwyck around. Uh-uh. No tricks. You thought about your dog getting run over or you were out of there. <laughs> I mean, I've studied the, the classic styles. Uh, Johnny Whitaker, Billy Moomy. 
Lauren Chapin, uh, uh, Billy Gray, who, who many consider to be the James Dean of child actors. Oh, um, a quick plug. All of these people will be appearing on my talk show, We Thought You Were Dead. <laughs> if my grant comes through. The point is, when Bobby and Cindy were lost in the Grand Canyon, I knew it, I felt it, and it showed up on the screen. <laughs> years on that show, spilling my guts out all over the heartland of America, and I don't have a dime to show for it. <laughs> Residuals? What's that? Yeah. Every day I drive past Emmanuel Lewis's palatial compound on my way to my glamorous studio apartment in Panorama City that I share with three other actresses. <laughs> Uh, by the way, if you need to get a hold of uh, Quinn Cummings or Erin Moran or Martin O'Brien, we share an answering machine. <laughs> or you could call our agent, Burt Ward. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I forgot this was supposed to be a poem. All right, um, uh, roses are red, violets are blue. Ronnie Howard just made $5 million in the time it took to read this to you. <laughs> normally would attend. After discussing the night with her, we were delighted when she said wild horses couldn't keep me away from lending my name and talents to an evening of such import. Apparently, lending her name and talents does not include wearing the Peg Bundy wig and spandex pants that would help people recognize who the fuck she is. <laughs> Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Katie Seagal, plain rap. <laughs> <laughs> that was as brutal as I thought. <laughs> Could have been a lot worse. <sighs> this poem is to uh, help illustrate the reason we're all here tonight. The last time uh, Ron and Michael did a comedy poetry night, I couldn't perform because, uh, because I don't believe that these events should be done unless the money raised goes towards a good cause. <laughs> this time, when Ron, Michael, and Marjorie approached me and told me tonight was to raise money to help find spines for the spineless, <laughs> I simply had to say yes. <laughs> Not only is it a good cause, but it was a problem I wasn't even aware of. <laughs> but when Ron described the daily harrowing torment the spineless must endure, I, I dropped everything. I don't want to bring this down, but hey man, we are talking about people who don't have the luxury of spines that we all take for granted. When was the last time any of us said to ourselves, what if I had no spine? You know, imagine the suffering of crawling into a producer's office carrying the script in your mouth. You're at Spago. You reserved a table, at the window table. Joan Van Ark has taken the table and you can't do anything about it because you are one of the nation's spineless. Some of you are asking yourselves, what can I do? Or, what can my assistant do? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, on April 12th, I have organized a march. It's a crawling kind of thing in Washington. Celebrities and spineless Americans are invited to join me in an attempt to make our nation's leaders aware of this horrific problem that Ron Zimmerman, Michael DeBar, and Marjorie Gross assure me is reaching epidemic proportions. media coverage and especially since Ed Begley pulled a Gus Grissom on us and chickened out. And, uh, well we figured just, you know, since you're such a costume, he that, that you know, you might show up. You used me? Oh. <laughs> you mean I'm after 
actually a big enough star to be used? Insecure, paranoid, disillusioned, and filled with rage at parasites like you. See, Fallon, you didn't think you were a big enough star. Now, now, get out there and abuse your power. Well, wait a minute. What am I reading? Well, well there's Ed Cancel, whom we won his present spell, so we wrote a tribute to him. Uh, a tribute to Ed? Oh, that's so sweet. Okay. Okay. The Ed Begley Jr. story. A tribute. <laughs> Careers are like the refrigerator. You open it up, the light goes on, and you see some cherished foods gone bad, and some dietary staples still fresh for consuming. Some foods have expiration dates, some don't. Some foods look so tasty sitting in the jar. Borscht is like that. It almost looks sweet, when in reality, it's sour. <laughs> Some foods, like stew, are better reheated, more flavorful, richer. This, then, is the Ed Begley Jr. story. Walk with me now into the refrigerator of his life. Wait a minute. It was 1976. Ed's career was at its first apex. He got a call from his agent, Burt Ward. He told him of a job, a job offer that would set off a series of events which would change his life forever. He was offered the role of the timid but courageous Jew in the Holocaust opposite Merrill Street. But that was before it was the hippest job in show business to play opposite Merrill Street, so he turned it down. <laughs> he actually recommended a gentle, stable young actor named James Woods. <laughs> Ed went to grammar school with Michael Cimino. So when, he began, when uh, he began wooing him to play the lead opposite Meryl Streep in The Deer Hunter, he thought long and hard before he turned it down. <laughs> he did, however, recommend a young Italian kid he had enjoyed in some stupid gangster movie, which he also turned down, but that's another poem. <laughs> Kramer versus Kramer was the finest script Ed had yet been offered to star in, except for the one he chose over it. A pilot for ABC, co-starring Marianne Mobley and Joanne Flug, called Four Bosoms and Buddy. <laughs> he said it was just too damn good to pass up. It tested through the roof, but proved too hip for middle America. 1981. Sure, Sophie had some tough choices, but that year, Ed Begley Jr. did too. Play the dashing, tragic, romantic lead opposite Meryl Streep, or be a house husband and wait for a script with what he called real meat on it. <laughs> Unlike Sophie, once he weighed the facts, his choice was clear. Ed turned it down and recommended a young actor he had seen in a dark, moody Broadway show about a singing pirate and his chick. <laughs> 1984. The lady that wrote Out of Africa sure knew her way around an IBM Selectric. Why Sidney Pollock called Ed in Aspen, and he was happy to discuss playing the lead opposite Merrill Street. This was one time Ed was ready to respond with a resounding, how much? <laughs> Until Pollock told him he would be required to perform the role with an English accent. Ed asked Pollock, is Merrill Street doing an English accent? He said, no, not exactly. To which Ed replied, then neither am I. Legend has it Begley then told Pollock, I don't do impressions. You want an actor or you want Robert Redford? It's your call. <laughs> it seemed as though Ed Begley Jr. would never create screen history with the now legendary Meryl Streep. Still, fresh from the artistically draining experience of matching dramatic skills with the intense powerhouse that is Howie Mandel, <laughs> he was offered a new challenge. Ed picked up the script to She Devil, and let me tell you, he smelled money. 
and lots more when he learned Roseanne Barr had spilled a few donut crumbs on the same paper. He fought against his usual first instinct to turn it down at the request of his then wife, who said to him, a cry in the dark, Transylvania 65,000, I want a divorce. All Ed could say was, it's this hunk's turn to create cinema magic with Lost Street. Never being one to make the same mistake 10 times. <laughs> he began lobbying fiercely, knowing he would have to beat out actors of Peter Scolari's caliber to be the man on the business end of Meryl Streep's first big screen, it's a g -g -g ghost double take. <laughs> Christmas, one year later, Sneaking into a Saturday evening 8 o'clock show of the film to gauge audience reaction, which proved difficult because the audience, well, I mean the guy, was very angry. <laughs> was very angry at being woken from a sound sleep, and his Spanish cursing rang, rang in Ed's ears, like the church bell on Sunday in a place second generation Hollywood brats can't relate to. Alan Thicke once said, <laughs> quoting all the greats, this town never forgets a giant hit or a giant bomb. So, armed with the knowledge that Ed Begley Jr. Has, is etched in your memories forever, he moves on to his next challenge. Catch Ed this fall starring in Parenthood, the on-air commitment com comedy series. Or, if you're traveling through Guatemala, be sure to go see that country's number one box office hit, Senorita Diablo, <laughs> starring El Grande Streep and other Americanos. <laughs> but Ed, Beg Ed Begley Jr. has no regrets. It goes along with everything else he doesn't have. His wife, his kids, his money, his self-respect, his three-picture deal with Orion, Meryl Streep's home phone number, messages and invites on his answering machine. But there's two things he'll always have, bullshit and a bus fare. <laughs> I didn't write it. Ed Begley Jr., a man, a myth, a legend, a huge sap. This is his story. The end. You sure this is a tribute? <laughs> Eddie used to be a friend of mine. Katie sings here Wednesday and Thursdays next week. She comes here. She's absolutely magnificent. Now, Ken Ober is frequently referred to as the poet's poet. As the host of Remote Control, he was frequently referred to as the game show host's game show host. <laughs> He laughed at that, that's so cute. Recently landing a role in the new Parenthood TV series, he is already being referred to as the supporting actor's supporting actor. Also known as the Ron Howard ass kisser's Ron Howard ass kisser. <laughs> Ken arrived in Hollywood three short weeks ago and is already so insecure he was willing to subject himself to this kind of heartless ridicule. So please, give a warm round of apathy to another guy who would strangle a, strangle a puppy to meet Michelle Pfeiffer. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Ober. Thank you very much. I have a problem here. Once in a while, a dream comes true. In Hollywood, more often, if you're a moderately funny Jew. <laughs> Two and a half years spent I on MTV with downtown Julie Brown who wouldn't fuck me. Uh, I know that doesn't rhyme, but it's true. And it hurts. She purposely fucked guys that look like me and then danced with them on that stupid club show that she does. But hey, I'd like to take the high road. But before I do, the other Julie Brown wouldn't fuck me either. It's those Browns. They're all the same. I handed Jackson Brown a check for like 10 grand to feed Nicaraguan refugees. Couldn't even get a peck on the cheek. 
I had Bobby Brown hogtied my suite at the Carlisle Hotel, and he looked at me like I was dirt. I thought I could get a blowjob from James Brown if I shared a cell with him. <laughs> they won't even let me change planes in Cleveland. Anyway, back to the high road. Oh, you know who else won't fuck me? <laughs> Stephanie Zimbalist. Yeah, sure. She'll sign for a package from a psycho who makes John Hinckley look like an occasional moviegoer. But me, with a solid possible 13 on the air, she avoids like a Pierce Brosnan Us interview. Colin Quinn, my ex-gravel-throated co-host, has some bullshit development deal with Viacom, and he's fucking Emmy nominees like they're dropping out of the sky. Hey, what's wrong with your town, man? Accept me. Nurture me. Sleep with me. City of angels. Yeah, right. City of, okay, but just for lunch. What's the matter with you people? Don't you fuck in the daylight? You think the sun can stop me? Who am I, Frank Langella? You see a widow peak up here, huh? These aren't fangs, ladies. These are the best caps multimillionaire entrepreneur power broker Brian Grazer can buy. Now listen, and listen good. I'm only gonna wax poetically about this once. I want my French model from Glendale, and I want her now. I want a paragraph in the reporter's great wife section, whether I have one or not. Okay, Hollywood. You wanna play rough? Come on, take your best shot. Parenthood the series is just the start. Next, I'll get an agent. And then, Dana Delaney. Well, don't take a feature on your next hiatus. Thank you. Your picture taken. She wants to laugh at and not with celebrities. She wants to schmooze producers and network executives. She wants to meet a cute guy that isn't her husband. She wants to get out of the house because her life sucks too. In a world where people go to any length to hide the skeletons in their closets. How refreshing to have someone that not only lets you see inside, but has the audacity to turn it into a career. That is why we were so honored when Pamela said she would read here tonight. Nothing was spared in our efforts to make her shining moments on stage the standout spot of this evening. Now, Pamela DeVar. You know, at the last possible second, I have been called to replace Howie Mandel. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <sighs> I have spent my entire life on this earth fawning over incredibly cool rock stars, throwing my self-esteem out the window to befriend performers who shaped entire generations. Worshipping from afar, and close up, <laughs> most impossibly talented icons. And when I'm asked to fill in at a show, a supposedly hip show, mind you, what am I given? <laughs> hey, Pammy, wacky how he can't make it, so how about filling his shoes? Gee, Michael, excuse me while I swoon. <laughs> God, don't worry. Good old Miss Pamela will do what she's asked. What's that? Wear a big rubber glove on my head? Sure, Mikey. <laughs> no problem. Get a perm. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Let's not forget a fucking chicken suit, huh? How about a pie in my face, huh? I guess it's really shocking that I choose to live in the past. I guess I really fucked up. <laughs> I cherish the memory of a few nights with the stones. <laughs> when I can pinch it for a guy whose comedy makes Jerry Lewis movies look like I want to live, huh? One day I'm gonna get some self-esteem 
and tell everybody to kiss my ass. I know our reputation is not that great. Now to my horror, I know why. I can replace Howie Mandel at the last minute. I really can. Oh my God. All those fabulous blowjobs for nothing. <laughs> She used to be a friend of mine, so. <laughs> All right. Now, next month, David Cassidy will be 40 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, can you fucking deliver? You know, I know, much bigger round of applause for Dave. I love Dave. Best hair in rock and roll, didn't you think? I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch him, I said, God, what conditioner does he use? I love this guy. <laughs> Hannah, yeah. Speak to your girlfriend about that. Um, all right, he's going to be 40 years old. A landmark for some, a busy day with Victoria Principal's husband for day. <laughs> He'll be sucking collagen out of sheep like a bilge pump. Something I'm quite familiar with. Um, David's TV sister, Susan Day, is now one of the most respected actresses in Hollywood. David's stepmother, Shirley Jones, won an Academy Award for her timelessly brilliant performance in Elma Gantry. When David was 14, he won a spelling bee against such countries <laughs> as Richard Dreyfuss, Albert Brooks, and Peter Fonda. Unable to find any other notable achievements, <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were forced to turn to the press release. His agent, Bert Ward, <laughs> hangs on the wall of every deli and dry cleaner in town. Quote, Mr. Cassidy is a multi-talented singer, songwriter, actor, and speller. <laughs> 